Okay. Welcome back. This segment is going to explain <clears throat> my findings regarding Social Security. It'll be a lengthy segment. Every provision that I cite in here is going to be in your provisions package. All those statutes are in order. And once again, on the left-hand side of the page, these are all the statutes. Bottom, 1939 tax code here. These are all the regulations. And in here is, uh, are the provisions for five arguments. We're only going to be using uh, several of these. Social Security is the argument of mine which requires more provisions be argued, but it is uh, taken from the entire tax code and not just within the chapters that impose Social Security. And what we're going to do here, I'm going to show you, chapter one, I'm saying that's me, chapter one, U.S. citizen, section one tax, that's me, tax code applies to me. Social Security, this is my target. Chapter two, self-employed Social Security, Chapter 21, FICA Social Security. So this self-employed, and this is wage or employee, okay? And this is both. They tax both the wage earner and the self-employed uh, self under Chapter 1 of the code. Now, my target is Chapters 2 and 21. I don't want to pay Social Security. I'm taking that brick out of their foundation. That's all I'm going to do in this segment just Social Security. Well, first off, I am this citizen, 1.1-1C. When you see me use a decimal point, 1.1, that's always a regulation, period. It's part one of the Code of Federal Regulations for Title 26, and it's written under Statute 1, and it's the first regulation written under Statute 1, 1.1-1. So, 1 point, that's part one of the CFR, 1.1, that's one, the statute it's written under, and the regulation number. So that's the citizen I am. Well, I think that the citizen over here, section 1402B, 1402B says an individual who is not a citizen, let me see, <laughs> this one, what you're going to find in this definition is a forking tongue smoke and mirrors, and a double negative, all in one statute. It's a work of art. It's like somebody said, define the term citizen. I don't care how far you have to run to define it. Now I'm looking at provision number 13 in the secret provisions. It's on page four. An individual who is not a, okay, is this me? 1.1-1C is provision number Looks like it's provision number 29. This is who I say I am. Provision number 29. Who is a citizen? 1.1-1C. Every person born or naturalized in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction is a citizen. That's me. You tell me if this is the same citizen. Back to number 13. 1402B. An individual who is not a citizen of the United States, but who is a resident of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, or American Samoa, shall not for the purpose of this chapter, be considered to be a non-resident alien individual. I got an idea. How about if you just define the term citizen? Okay. They just ran a marathon to keep from saying, this is for the possessions only. Okay. Let's go to the implementing regulation for this one. And you find a work of art. Okay. And I'm talking about 1402B-1D, uh, the 42nd provision in this. This is a, it's a masterful uh, convert. This is a regulation written to implement that definition we just saw. A non-resident alien never has self-employment income. Okay. Non-resident alien to what? To the citizen we're talking about. If he's non-resident alien to this chapter, he'll never owe this tax. And I'm in chapter two. A non-resident alien individual will never have self-employment income, while a non-resident alien individual who derives income from a trade or business carried on in the United States, Puerto Rico, blah, 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 the possessions, may be subject to applicable, in, applicable income tax position, uh, provisions on such income. Such non-resident alien will not be subject to the tax on self-employment income, since any net earnings which he may have do not constitute self-employment income. Now, for the purposes 
of the tax on self-employment income, that's chapter two, an individual who is not a citizen of the United States, but who is a resident of the Commonwealth of Guam, or, uh, Puerto Rico, excuse me, Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, is not considered a non-resident alien individual. Let's start at the top of this one, okay? A non-resident alien, and I'm in chapter two, will never owe this tax, but he might owe some other tax. A non-resident alien will never owe this tax in chapter two, but he might owe some other tax. Well, what I just did, uh, I got 1402B, um, I'm supposed to include 1401 because that imposes the tax. Now we're going to go to the regulations. There's only three regulations in this chapter that I look at, okay? 1.1401A-1A, 1.1402A, 1.1402A, 1.1402B-1D, and 1.1402A. Dash two A. Okay. We just read this middle one, fourteen zero two B dash one D, which says a non-resident alien will never owe this tax, but he might owe some other tax. Well, if you don't owe Chapter One and you're self-employed, what is the only other chapter in the code that taxes self-employed people? There's only two taxes in the code, two chapters that address the self-employed and a non-resident alien will never owe chapter two. Chapter one is the only other chapter that imposes a tax on the self-employed. Trade or business, you get deductions for the wages you pay out to your employees, section 162. Okay, uh, trade or business, um, uh, 61A, gross income, wages, fees, compensation, tips, salaries. Okay, section one, or chapter one is the only other chapter that taxes the self-employed and 1.1402B-1D says a non-resident alien will never owe this tax, but he might owe some other tax. The only other one he could owe is Chapter 1. So this regulation just kicked a non-resident alien to Chapter 2 into my chapter. Cool. Here's a provision in Chapter 1 that does the same thing. Kicks a non-resident alien to this chapter into Chapter 2. Section 879A2. <coughs> And this is provision number eight. Uh, provision number eight. Very good. When it says to treat, to figure out how to treat a non-resident alien partner's share of distributive income or a non-resident alien spouse, go to chapter two. Treat it under fourteen zero two. So I got a chapter one provision now, sending me to chapter two to figure my tax if I'm a non-resident alien to the citizen in chapter one. <clears throat> Now, you know, can you see how much combing through the code I had to do to come up with this argument? Well, I'm going through statute by statute looking for references to sections 1401 through 1403 and 3101 through 3128. I'm looking for references to those statutes, to these two chapters, or to the name of this tax or the name of that tax, which is FICA. Okay? I went through the whole code looking for references to these taxes. And I came up with things like this statute that says uh, to figure, okay, uh, 879A2, tax treatment of certain community income in the case of non-resident alien individuals, A, general rule, in the case of a married couple, one or both of whom are non-resident alien individuals to this citizen. <clears throat> Such community income shall be treated as follows. Number two, trade or business income shall be treated as provided in section 1402A. Chapter two, if you're non-resident alien here, you figure your tax over here. So, I got this one and this one, kicking non-resident aliens into the opposite chapters. You can't be both citizens. You do figure this tax with these provisions and uh, let me see, it's, uh, I always get these two confused, I want to get it right. The, uh, okay, 1401-1A, I've got an extra A in there, sorry. 1401-1A says, this tax shall be levied, assessed, and collected as part of the income tax imposed by, sub or imposed by sections one or three. This is great. You know what this is? We're going to get back to that in just a second. This one right here, 1402 is definitions. This defines self-employment income. 
14028, it's number 41 on your list of provisions. Computations of net earnings from self-employment. General rule, for the purposes of ascertaining his net earnings from self-employment uh, are to be determined by reference to the provisions of law and regulations applicable to, or with respect to taxes imposed by sections one and three. This regulation right here says to figure this tax, you use chapter one provisions, okay? So that's why these three regulations I'm drawing on. This one says non-resident aliens, different chapters, different citizenships. This one says you use chapter one to figure the tax. This one says add the two taxes together. We can't do that, can we? This is the regulation that lets them do what they do. So if indeed I am not this citizen, 1402B, uh, 3121E, which was provision number 15, Definition of citizen in FICA, this is not me, and it doesn't use the term includes, me. An individual who is a citizen of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, but not otherwise a citizen of the United States, shall be considered a citizen of the United States. I don't think Congress intended that I be subject to that, or they would have defined citizen in terms of born and nationalized in the United States as subject to the jurisdiction like they did in Chapter 1, okay? Very simple. So, that's not my citizenship, and under our maxims, our canons of statutory interpretation and construction, I need to know, can Congress really define U.S. citizen in terms like that? So now, I've got my, that's everything I use for chapter two. That's everything I use in chapter one that's about this chapter. Now we're in chapter 21, FICA. Okay? And I want to look at uh, definitions here. I went to the definition of citizen under my statutory definition in regulation here, and I found that fork and tongue and <clears throat> that's that marathon to keep from telling me more about the definition. And in FICA, I use two regulations, 31.0. That means it's not even written under a statute, is it? It's part 31 of the CFR. Zero, it's preliminary regulations that imply that all of subtitle C, chapters 21 through 25. And so in 31.0-2A1, and you have this on your list, <clears throat> I want to know more about this definition. So I found this, which applies to the definitions, and it says, and this is beautiful, all it says is that you can't read into things, things which aren't here. That's all it says, uh, and I need more of those going on. Can't get enough of those. Bottom of page eight, I'm looking at provision number 43 in our list. <clears throat> the terms defined in the provisions of law contained in the regulations in this part, that's part 31 of the CFR, employment taxes, shall have the meaning so assigned to them. I have a provision that applies to the definitions I'm about to look at in the regulations. That's all. The next one <clears throat> is number 44, and that is the next regulation I'm going to rely on, which is 31.3121E-1B, and that is the definition of citizen in regulation, just as we did in chapter two, we went to the definition of citizen. <clears throat> in regulation we have, top of page nine, the term citizen of the United States includes, remember the statute didn't use the term includes? We gotta have that in there, it's our tool, we need it. The Secretary of the Treasury is saying to everybody, write a regulation and get that term includes in there. We need it. So we don't find the term includes until we get to regulation, but they need it in there really bad. That's why it's there. It wasn't in the statute that defines citizen, was it? So here we go. The term citizen of the United States includes a citizen of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and effective on a certain date, Guam and some American Samoa. That's not me. And it has the term includes in there. They finally got the term includes. They have to bring it in themselves to misenforce this one. Because the statute 3121E, defining citizen, doesn't use the term include. They had to bring it in somewhere. So now I've got a framework. This one says this has meaning so assigned to it. This one says the terms used in this part shall have the meaning so assigned to them. This one has the meaning so assigned to it, whether it uses the term includes or not. Isn't that neat? Okay statutory basis for everything. Now, what did I find outside of these chapters? I said I went through the code. I didn't go just through these chapters. <clears throat> I went through the code looking for things that say Social Security is just for the possessions. 
So I went through the code looking for mention of 1401 through 1403, 3101 through 3128, or a reference to Chapter 2 or to Chapter 21, or a reference to self-employment tax or to FICA. I went through the whole code looking for references to these taxes to find more evidence that, indeed, FICA is just for these citizens, 1402B and 3121E. And outside of these chapters, I found plenty of indicators. 7655, in a part of the code called Possessions, it says for taxes imposed on possessions, see chapters 2 and 21. Thanks. Wasn't that nice? Okay. Wasn't that nice? I just got a statute that says, you're right. For chapters in post of possession, see chapters 2 and 21. Which one on the list is that? Number 22. Go ahead, read it. Don't take my word for it. That's what this is for. So that whenever I mention a statute, you can look it right up in here. 7655. Imposition of tax in the possessions. For precision, for provision, I'd like to buy a bell. For provisions imposing tax in the possession, see 1, Chapter 2, relating to the tax and self-employment income, and 2, Chapter 21, relating to the tax under the Federal Insurance Contributions Act. Thanks. Wasn't that a nice little gift? Here I am building up all this, and then I come across a statute that says, oh yeah, oh that's right. Okay, that's nice. Okay. Next, <clears throat> and this is by far the... Uh, the finest needle in the haystack that I can uh, identify in all of my findings. This particular statute, and I'm going to say this uh, first in story form, <clears throat> the, uh, the paralegal gets married and he goes to the Virgin Islands on his honeymoon and his wife gets sunburned uh, beyond the point where she can really come out of the room so she's stuck for a day when they're recuperating and uh, gosh I'm the paralegal I uh, have no life, why don't I go check out the law, li law library here in the Virgin Islands? I got nothing better to do, you know, like snorkeling, uh, jet skiing, whatever. Anyway, I'm going to go to the law library, and I'm looking through the, the law of the Virgin Islands, and I'm looking through their revised organic act, organic act and uh, I come across section 28A, and 28A says blah, 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 this, that, and the other thing, and any tax imposed by section 3811 of the Internal Revenue Code, blah, blah, blah. Section 3811 of the Internal Revenue Code mentioned in section 28A of the Revised Organic Act of the Virgin Islands. When I see section in our tax code 7651, parentheses 5, parentheses capital A, 7651, 5A. By the way, that's one of the only statutes I've ever seen that has a number directly after the number of the statute. It usually starts with a letter. Anyway, 76515A says any reference in Section 28A of the Revised Organic Act of the Virgin Islands shall be construed to mean Chapters 2 and 21. Any reference in Section 28A of the Revised Organic Act to, quote, any tax imposed by Section 3811 Internal Revenue Code, end quote, shall be, turned, uh, shall be deemed to uh, mean Chapters 2 and 21. Let's see how I did on the quote of that. Uh, number 21, statute number 21 in our list here. For the purposes of this section, the reference in Section 28A of the Revised Organic Act of the Virgin Islands to, quote, any tax specified in Section 3811 Internal Revenue Code, end quote, shall be deemed to refer to any tax imposed by Chapters 2 and 21. Now I have section 3811 of the Internal Revenue Code equated with chapters 2 and 21. Chapters 2 and 21 are my target. I'm not Social Security citizen. That's not me. And this one says section 3811 imposes the tax. You may as well just consider it to be section th uh, chapters 2 and 21. So I went to section 3811 of the Internal Revenue Code. <clears throat> it's not there. Never has been. How long have the Virgin Islands been around? Before 1954 when the tax code was rewritten? Oh, the year after. <laughs> yeah, a year after. No, a long time. So I went back to the 1939 tax code, to section 3811. Collection of taxes in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. A, Puerto Rico, B, Virgin Islands. In 1954 when they rewrote the code, they simply split that statute up into chapters 2 and 21. 
That's all they did. And that's why you still have the definition of citizen that says possessions only, citizen that says possession only, and this is funny, 42 U.S.C. has chapters providing for the administration of Social Security. These two chapters impose it. 42 U.S.C. provides for the administration, and you find the definition of citizen in section 411b2. And section 411b2 reads identical to 1402b in chapter 2. The guy in this chapter shall never be considered to be a, a non-resident alien individual. The citizen of the possessions, remember, shall not, for the purpose of this chapter, be considered a non-resident alien individual. Let's go back and read 1402b. And that is provision number 13. Okay? Read. And that is provision number 13. Okay? Read uh, number 13 again. Now, who is not a non-resident alien? An individual who is not a citizen of the United States, but who is a resident of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, or, Amer or American Samoa, shall not, for the purposes of this chapter, be considered to be a non-resident alien individual. First off, is that a citizen of possession they're talking about? Citizen of possession, okay. He's not a non-resident alien individual. He shall not be considered one. If he's not a non-resident alien individual, what is he? He's a resident citizen, okay. So if he's not, a Puerto Rican, Guam, American, small Virgin Islands, shall be considered a citizen. And he shall not be considered a non-resident alien. That's not me. Okay? So we have this same guy who shall not be considered a non-resident alien. Congress can lay and collect income taxes. Congress has named the subject in this statute, citizen of possessions. This statute, 1402B, citizen of possessions. This statute, 3121E, citizen of the possessions. We've got a statute that says chapter 2 and 21, tax and imposed of possession. 76515A says the origin of Social Security, section 3811 of the 1939 Internal Revenue Code. And when we go to that, we find the statutory origin of Social Security is collection of taxes in Puerto Rico and uh, Virgin Islands. 3811A and B. That simple. Isn't that neat? So here we have a total statutory framework. Now listen, who knows whether or not statutes are evidence? Yes. What kind of evidence? I'm sorry? Primary evidence. Primary evidence. It's, uh, it's absolute evidence. There's a term for it. Evidence of law, I think. Evidence of law? Yes, it is evidence of law. The code is evidence of law, but you won't find any public laws associated with the income tax code. Right. Uh, it was all drafted for Congress and brought to them. And the amendments they made after that, you will have public law written for it. <clears throat> but the tax code doesn't have public law because Congress didn't write it. You won't find public laws for the authority to levy, assessment, none of that. It was written for Congress by somebody. I'll bet they were bankers. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm making leaps and bounds here, wasn't I? None of you knew that, did you? Uh, anyway, now, this is so important, and uh, you got this with your course. Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company versus FDA. Anybody hear that case? It's only about two years old. FDA is saying, hey, find that cashier under federal law for selling cigarettes to a minor. And, and all this other stuff, and Brown and Williamson Tobacco took them to court saying, excuse me, but there is no statutory authority for the FDA to regulate tobacco products. And they won. Huh. On the appellate level, it was affirmed by the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court didn't get into the statutory analysis. They simply put a stamp of approval on what the Fourth Circuit Appellate Court did. <coughs> the Fourth Circuit Appellate Court, excuse me, <coughs> <clears throat> went about this case in the same fashion the Supreme Court has told me in all these cases that I provided in the course how you're supposed to interpret statute. And um, they started with, the in the opinion of the court, they give you an introduction, and then they say, one, intrinsic evidence. 
and the intrinsic evidence is where they dissected all the public laws, the statutes, and the regulations. So statutes and regulations are intrinsic evidence. That's how important they are. They're the foundation of the case. <clears throat> Part two of that decision or opinion is called extrinsic evidence. And that was all the commentary from the uh, FDA in former, or, uh, I'm sorry, prior uh, congressional hearings on the matter where they're saying outright, we have no authority to regulate tobacco. And so they brought in all these different comments and articles and, and places where uh, it could be, uh, <coughs> Uh, it could be observed that the FDA understood itself to have no authority over tobacco, and now it's saying that it does. So the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company brought in their intrinsic evidence, statute and regulation, and then the extrinsic, extrinsic evidence, which was, what have they said in the past regarding this? It's not law, is it? It's simply evidence to bring in, but the primary evidence, the intrinsic evidence, was statute. And so I'm resting on a very firm ground when I use strictly statute, strictly maxims, doctrines, how you must interpret the law to go about this. I'm using strictly intrinsic evidence to prove every point I make. That's neat. Uh, not everybody can do that with the tax code. And so, under this framework, it's clear. In administration, that's not me. That's not me. And that's not me. The origin is a tax imposed just for the possessions. Show me where Congress has broadened its scope. We can't. <laughs> we can't show you that because it doesn't exist. They've always limited just to these citizens. And this is our target regulation right here, 1.1401-1A, which says, add this to the tax imposed by Chapter 1. They don't have a regulation like that over here that says add this to the Chapter 1 tax. For FICA, they don't have that. All they have is the term includes in this regulation. That's how they're accomplishing Social Security. They're saying, let's ignore this definition of Chapter 2 citizenship. It's got so much smoke and mirrors in it, we'll get away with it. And then write a regulation that says add these two taxes together. And over here in FICA, definition of citizen doesn't use the term includes like the definition of state in the United States does in 3121E. So we need the term includes in there somewhere. So let's write, the, write this definition here that says it has the meaning so assigned to it, but it's far removed. It's under zero. It's in a preliminary portion, so I hope they don't find it. And then put includes into this regulation so we can do it to FICA over here in Chapter 1 Citizen also. And that's how they do Social Security. But all this intrinsic evidence indeed leans a different way, doesn't it? So that's my argument, is under this statutory scheme, we find an inherent pattern of the exclusion of the citizen of the United States from the scope of this tax. I will not pay Social Security. Okay? That's the Social Security argument, is I went through the entire code to come up with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 or 15 statutes to explain Social Security. And they're all beamed at proving the argument along lines of citizenship. That's all. Very simple. I could have gone a lot further, like definition of self-employment income in that chapter is uh, occupation of a public office. Have you seen that? 1402, okay? I didn't go that far. That's, that's a real small argument, really in the midst of a much bigger one. And that is, along citizenship terms, they simply can't say Congress intended the citizen born or naturalized in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction. They didn't intend that when they said a non-resident alien or that the Puerto Rican is not an honor as an alien. They weren't talking about me, or they just said 1.1-1C. This guy, citizen possessions, they weren't talking about me. And you can't read me into that without uh, forgetting this, these tens of Supreme Court cases under these doctrines of void for vagueness, exclusively alterious, <coughs> uh, clear language, tax must be imposed by clear language. They can't get by all those without admitting to willfully committing a dereliction of duty to say what the law is. So, uh, that's Social Security. I went through the entire code for my, extri for my intrinsic evidence, and it all that I chose to use leans toward con uh, confirmation or validation of my claim that the citizen in 1.1-1C cannot be this citizen. They are not the same citizen. You cannot be both, and therefore I will not pay both taxes. 
now that I'm out of Social Security in chapters 2 and 21, I'm left subject only to chapter 1. And once I'm in chapter 1, let's see if I have any protections there. But first things first, I want to challenge. I, want to, I don't want to be double taxed. Let's dispose of Social Security first. And then we'll go into my chapter and see if we have any project, uh, protections there. And you'll see that in the uh, segment on Section 83 of the Tax Code. You've got a book on it. You have a professional opinion letter in your course on it. And uh, we're going to do the Section 83 equation next. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Did, did you like the way I've laid this out through the entire code to show you categories of enforcement mm -hmm. by certain chapters? Uh, citizenship, it's a very broad challenge. And with our general principles, we can walk right into this and really swing a stick, saying, just tell me that's your citizenship, Your Honor. If you tell me that's your citizenship, Your Honor, I'll say it's mine. You tell me that this describes your citizenship, Your Honor. You tell me this describes your son, your daughter, your wife, and I'll say it describes me. No sweat. Just put it on the record. Okay. Say this is your citizenship and I'm with it, Your Honor. Let's go for it. You and me. I'm with you. Just say that's your citizenship. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, strictly statutory challenges based on citizenship, congressional language, fundamental principles, and say, I can't read anything into this. Okay? And uh, I'll see you in the next segment. That's going to be about Section 83. Thanks.